Centers for Creative Leadership brought out a, um, a research study in the fall of last year, which concerned me a little bit, and it said that 75% of careers are derailed, 75% of careers are derailed because the leader isn't able, isn't emotionally resilient, isn't able to navigate growth and change without like losing it on a regular basis, isn't able to build and keep trust in the team's experience, um, isn't a, oh, we lost our little thingy. I waited too long, huh? Well, we're gonna have to just figure it out. Um, oh, goody. Um, and um, isn't, wasn't able to manage their emotional state in conflict. Ooh, yeah, anybody see people lose it in conflict? Yeah, little age regression. And are you two years old or are you 50? Yeah. So let's talk about a couple of tools today. And I want you guys, I want this to be like kind of, you know, fireside chat-ish, okay? But there are seven, what we found in the thousand companies that we've worked with, and what we do is we, we take the latest neuroscience research, some of it not useful, the stuff that we do like, we map it down to then leadership tools, and then we do executive coaching, organizational development, we've worked with two US presidents, that'll be over cocktails, I'm not gonna talk about that right now on film, um, <laughs> eight billionaires, and um, 700 the Fortune 1000 and, seven, and 300 um, mid-sized companies. And what we found is that there really are seven pieces to this. And I was an engineer, some of you guys weren't born yet, but in the 1980s there was a company called Microsoft. <laughs> and I was an engineer working on operating systems and then I got bored and I went to Apple. Um, so I have like an engineering mind, but before that I was a Buddhist monk. So there's sort of a, a weird thing happening. So taking the Buddhist monk and taking the engineering mind and taking the neuroscience that I started studying when I was 16, um, what we find is that we can actually kind of chunk this into, into seven pieces. So start to notice as we go through these, quick like a bunny, um, releasing resistance. So the first thing that we need to do to be emotionally resilient is to stop resisting. How many of you guys have something that you're resisting in your life right now? Everybody has something, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Have you noticed how much energy it takes to like resist, to push against something? Yeah. So resistance, resistere, from Latin to uh, Middle English, means to push against. It takes tons of energy to resist something, tons. And here's the thing though, some things are unacceptable, right? And you're like, well, yeah, but I can't say it's okay because it's not, right? So what do I do with all that energy? The opposite of resistance actually is consenting. Now check this out for a sec. Consenting from consenter, okay, again, Latin to Middle English. Consenting means to be present to. It doesn't mean you're saying it's okay. You're just saying, this is happening. I'm not gonna deny it. I'm not gonna push against it. This is happening, all right? So I want us to start to notice the things that you're resisting in your life, the fabulous amount of energy that goes to them, and how you can just say, you know what? Okay, this is happening. When I travel all over the world and uh, work with clients, one thing I find the most prevalent emotion that I find people are experiencing is overwhelm. Anybody feeling overwhelmed just in the past maybe a few minutes even? Yeah. <laughs> and if we can just say, whoo, here I am feeling overwhelmed. That's consenting. It's not like, yay, overwhelm. It's like, Phew. or like, I'm not overwhelmed, I'm fabulous. Right? If we can just say, here I am feeling overwhelmed. Okay. Phew. All right. Now, what would I like? Because we have to take, we'll do the brain in one sec. We have to take the brain from focusing on the problem <coughs> to focusing on potential outcomes, bless you. Three parts of the brain, ever so quickly, that we're concerned with in leadership. Reptilian brain, mammalian brain, and the neocortex, prefrontal cortex. Reptilian brain, stimulus response machine, coded for safety, no understanding of quality of life. If the reptilian brain could speak, and it governs temperature regulation, breathing, balance, life support systems. If it could speak, it would say dead or not. It does not say alive or not. <laughs> dead, not dead, okay? It's all about keeping you not dead. Next, mammalian brain. This is where we have our emotional centers. The mammalian brain is really about um, keeping you emotionally safe. The limbic system actually over, overlaps both. The fight, flight, freeze, freeze response, overlaps both. 
But what's interesting about the mammalian brain is it's also where we have the hippocampus. The hippocampus governs learning and memory. How many of you guys have company values that nobody remembers? <laughs> yeah, I wonder why, right? Because they're not emotional. You know, Martin Luther King didn't say, you know, I have a dream. It might be kind of a lousy dream, but you know, it's a dream, right? It didn't work that way, right? Martin Luther King said, I have a dream, and it's a big, beautiful dream. And people were like, what's the dream? Tell me, tell me. So when we want someone to remember something, it's got to be emotional. And if you can't be emotional about it, and excited about it, and passionate about it, like, maybe you're doing the wrong thing, right? If it's just chopped liver, like, why bother, OK? So the mammalian brain, where we have the most of the fight, flight, freeze response, the mammalian brain, where we have the hippocampus, if it could speak, it would say friend or foe. A little bit more evolved than dead or not, OK? Getting a little bit more interesting. Keeping us safe still, though. Next, prefrontal cortex, right behind your forehead. It's about uh, the size of like a dinner napkin. Hasn't had an upgrade in 50,000 years, so don't get too impressed with yours, OK? <laughs> dogs have them, cats have them. Dogs have bigger ones. Woo, dogs, OK? The prefrontal cortex is where we have decision making, vision. The prefrontal cortex is where we say, I'm here, but ah, I want to be over there. How am I going to get there, OK? The prefrontal cortex is where we have language skills. It's where we have discrimination. It's where we have problem solving. But here's the thing. Often, we aren't in the prefrontal cortex because we are stressed and freaked out. If the prefrontal cortex could speak, it would say, what can I create? That is so much more interesting than friend or foe or dead or not. However, right, meanwhile back on Earth, we have um, changing directives, right? Lack of clarity. We're going this way. No, we're going to go this way. We've got politics, right? We've got all the stuff that happens in our lives. And we often go into amygdala hijack, or what we lovingly call critter state, OK? It's the state of fight, flight, freeze. We're basically going safe or not, dead or not, you know, and we're, we're locked down. We're back here in our creature neurology, in our reptilian main, uh, brain and mammalian brain, and our prefrontal cortex is unavailable. As leaders, it is our job, it is our great good fortune to help our people become resilient, meaning they go into critter state and we help them get out of critter state. So step one, release resilience. The opposite of critter state, smart state. We call it smart state because all three parts of your brain are working together. Innovation, collaboration, clear communication, connection, and of course, my favorite three things, safety, belonging, and mattering. If you've got safety, belonging, and mattering, you're good, OK? Whenever there's a problem you have with somebody, a disconnect with somebody, somebody's acting out, what are they asking you for? Pay attention. Thank you. How about if we just go up for just a sec? So we'll start at safety. Freedom from fear, right? Freedom from fear, certainty, knowing somebody has your back. Belonging, knowing that you fit in, right? You have equal value. You're loved, right? Mattering, good question. Mattering is being seen and acknowledged for your unique gifts. You're not a cog in a wheel. You're not just replaceable, right? It's your beautiful, unique gifts. Mastery, achievement. Ah, I did that. OK? It's OK, no problem. So I want us to start to look at this for a sec. So first notice the resistance. Notice what it feels like to just go, OK, this is actually happening, right? I did this with my mom with her leukemia, right? She was like, rah, rah, rah. I'm like, whenever, one day she'll be ready to say, OK, leukemia. And what would I like to do about it, right? But we had to kind of go through the rawr, OK? Because you got to go there. So next, increasing rapport with ourselves. We're not going to spend time on that because we don't have time to spend on it. Um, but well, we'll spend like a sec on it. But I want us to notice making new meaning. The way human beings experience the world is, remember the reptilian brain? Tons of stimulus response, visual, auditory, kinesthetic, olfactory, gustatory, our five senses. Data comes in to your brain stem, it goes zoom, and it goes into your mammalian brain, okay, where feelings are attached to it. And then it goes zoom into your prefrontal cortex where we make meaning. If you saw um, your boss, a leader in the company, somebody that is responsible for like maybe your livelihood, and they looked at you like, right? See, I heard that. Yeah. <laughs> 
how might you feel? How might you feel if you saw that, ver that, that visual expression, facial expression? How might you feel? We got the soundtrack. Ooh. Yeah, I don't belong. I'm scared. I'm scared. Uh, yeah, and adrenaline was pumping through your system. And so look how quickly we made that meaning. We made the, I'm scared, I maybe don't belong. Oh, she's disappointed in me again. This is how quickly we make meaning. Start to catch yourself making meaning, telling stories from pure raw sensory data. What if she or he just had a stomach ache and they're walking around going, right? And we're like making all this meaning around it. So start to notice that, how you make meaning. Let's have some fun with tools. All right. We're not going to go through the other ones because we don't have time. So let's look at the first super cute picture that we showed you. So emotional resilience. Oh, in case any of you, any of you who are like, oh, how resilient am I? You can go to uh, uh, smarttribesinstitute.com slash ERA. And it's a little emotional resilience assessment. It's super fun. It'll take you a sec. Yeah. And then you'll start to know, oh, now I know what chapter I should focus on in Power Your Tribe. OK? It'll save you a ton of time. Because like, I don't have an attachment. Read the whole book. Don't read the book at all. But it'll make your life better if you know which chapter to focus on. Seriously. Okay? <laughs> because I know some people think reading a book is kind of quaint. It's like, oh, like in old times, in olden times, we read these things called books. right? <laughs> now we look at infographics, which is why we have them here. Because people will look at a cute, a cute, quick picture. So there you are, feeling resistance. And then you're like, you know what, dude? I'm going to remember to consent. <sighs> OK. Whew. This is unpleasant. And it's happening, so I'm going to consent to it. Hmm, what would I like? Ah, I can't go there yet. I'm still really pissed off, OK? If you can't go to what you would like yet, do maneuvers of consciousness. This is the most awesome tool. You will love this. When you are in a situation that you're really irritated about or a person you're really irritated with, OK, it's going to take you 12 minutes to find out how resilient you are, OK? Please love yourself enough to try this. Step one. OK, set a timer. Ideally, have a buddy. Your buddy's job is just to sit there and hold space for you. They're not going to say anything. They're just going to operate the timer. And if you stop talking, they're going to say, come on, you can do it. Two more minutes to go, OK? So first, step one, negative evaluation. You have to get this stuff out of your system. Gosh, I hate this. This is such a stupid thing. So purge, OK? Whatever it is that you're resisting, purge it. So negative evaluation, what's bad about it? What you can't do, stand about it, really trash it. Right? But when the minutes are up, the party is over. The trashing ends. So get it while the getting's good. Okay? Go all the way in there. Okay? Three minutes is up. You look at the emotion wheel. How do I feel? I feel angry and resentful. Okay? Great. Next step, curiosity. Three minutes. Well, I wonder why this was so upsetting to me. Would this be upsetting to me a year from now? Would this be upsetting if I lived in Alaska instead of California? Would this be upsetting if I were blonde? OK? We start getting really curious about this and asking questions because we're starting to look at it, right? Here comes the Buddhism, right? We start to look at it from different angles. Curiosity pulls us out of being stuck in it. So enjoy those first three minutes because you're going to be in it, sisters, OK? Then, and brother or two, <laughs> brothers, maybe there's one. And then on curiosity, you're going to start to walk around it and get, and get kind of curious about it. Three minutes are up. Look at the emotion wheel. huh? My energy and my emotions are now actually shifting. Interesting. Then three minutes of amazement. Wow, it's kind of amazing that this actually occurred. It's like, how it, it's like the, the convergence of all these factors to make this thing happen is so interesting. So now you're not resisting it at all. You're kind of amazed by it and fascinated by it. Three minutes are up. Now you're probably in peaceful, powerful, joyful somewhere. And then full appreciation. Wow, it's kind of cool that I had this experience. Because it's helped me to grow. Resisting it was totally futile, right? Like the Borg said. And look at how much I've learned from it. And so in 12 minutes, you can go from being super, super irritated. So my mom passed away last October, October 14th. And before that, she had leukemia. She was really angry at her body for letting her down. So we had to just let her go through that. Then one day, she finally consented. And she said, OK. This is really happening. I'm tired of being angry. 
Use your weird neuro tools, honey. Let's just go beyond this. So I said, great, mom, let's do maneuvers of consciousness. So we did this, and she then was able to get out of that extreme resistance that she was experiencing. And then we went to the good stuff. If you can go straight to the good stuff because you're not super in resistance, go straight to the outcome frame, okay? The outcome frame is one of our favorite tools, and it's all about envisioning what we call in neuroscience the desired state. Remember what I said before about the prefrontal cortex? I'm here, but I want to be there. How do I get there? You're going to use the outcome frame um, with sales prospects because you need to take them to that glorious future, right, that you're going to enjoy together. You're going to use this with your spouse. You're going to use this with your kids to help them do their homework. You're going to use this with your aging parents, like I have with both of my parents as they were in their death process. You're going to use this with your friends. You're going to use this in teams. One of our clients launched a product. It didn't do very well in the market. All the engineers were finger pointing, right? Well, you did that wrong, and you did that wrong. And the CEO gathered together and just said, let's just do an outcome frame. So what would we like? Well, you know, we want a product that the customer's like, ah, oh, good. What will having that do for us? Well, we'll feel proud. We'll feel, we'll feel accomplished. We'll feel like we did it. We'll feel like we turned it around. So it's a series of questions. When you use the outcome frame, I encourage you to use it verbatim. Why? Good question. Tell me, you tell me. What's the difference between would and will? Would. What would you like? What is it? Yeah. So would is something is possible. Will is it will happen. It's yeah. going to happen. It is going to happen. It's, it's more, it, it's, uh, more certain, certain, maybe. So would, think of a buffet, right? What would you like? Hmm. I will take the salmon. OK? So notice what's happening here. Broad, right? Here's, here's a big, broad buffet. Now we're committing to the salmon in my example. And how will you know when you have it? OK, now we start to go through all these other questions. Here's what's going to happen. When you do this with somebody, and don't get too geeky about this, but when you do this with somebody, if you go in deep, please do this for 15 minutes. You might go, oh my god, 15 minutes, that's so long. 15 minutes, any human I've ever worked with for 15 minutes will load up enough visual, auditory, and kinesthetic structures that they actually will step into and test drive this glorious future. You need them to test drive it. Otherwise, it's like a silly fantasy. You might notice that their eyes are looking up and to the right. They're right, right? So you're left. Because they're starting to step into that glorious future and check it out and test drive it. Hmm, this is kind of nice over here. Maybe I'll create this, OK? So what would you like? A positive outcome you can create and maintain, not you know for Brad Pitt to marry me. Okay, you can't create and maintain that. Um, to be peaceful inside, regardless of what's happening outside, you can create and maintain that. So what would you like? And here's an example across the bottom. More strategic time. What will having that do for you? Ah, I'll feel more engaged and energized. Like I'm really making a difference to the business. Peaceful, powerful, huh? How will you know when you have it? Notice the specificity here. When I spend two hours or more each week on strategy and visioning, when I cut the number of meetings I attend by 25%, when my direct reports are at leadership level five. We're getting very specific. We're taking them into this glorious future, okay? My favorite question. Question number four is why they don't have question number one. You don't have more strategic time because what a value might you risk or lose? This is the ego question. Notice my words. What a value might you risk or lose? What side effects may occur? If you say, wow, what are you going to lose? They're going to go into critter state. You just lost that glorious future. Please use these words. This is hypnotic language, but it's not like moha, OK? It's like friendly hypnotic language. It's taking them to a pretty place, OK? Good. What a value might you risk or lose? Check this out. May initially feel less important. Uh oh, here comes the ego. Less involved in the minutia, OK? Have to let go of some control. Ah, who loves control? Ah, love it. Yes. Have to let go of it. Resist the temptation to rescue. Another tasty item, right? Resist temptation to rescue. Invest time in cultivating directs more powerfully. That's why this right here is why you don't have more strategic time, OK? Problem solved, right? Next, 
when, where, with whom would you like it? Because we've got to scope it. You know, I really want it within 45 days at work with my direct reports. I don't want it everywhere. I just want it here, okay? What are your next steps? Set up recurring strategic time in my calendar, one-on-ones, to build leadership, determine which meetings to skip, blah, blah, blah. This is your action plan. Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. The outcome frame is going to become one of your most favorite neuro tools. It is so, so helpful. Okay. Use this when someone's in critter state and you want to help them get out. Use this also when you want to do a brainstorming meeting to figure out what people really want. Um, my husband was really upset the other day, and I sat down with him and I said, so what would you like? He's like, you're using an outcome frame on me. <laughs> I said, yeah, but in five minutes you're gonna feel really good. <laughs> and he was like, okay, okay. Question, oh, we had two questions. We had another question over here, sorry. You, yeah, you don't have to do maneuvers of consciousness first. Use that if you're just like, Arr. okay, otherwise go right to the outcome frame. Yeah, was, was there another question over here? Okay, good. So, make sense? Okay, use this alone. Sometimes I'll sit down and go, you know what, what would I really like in this situation? And I'll just do one quietly alone. It's great for clarifying your thoughts. It's great for just, dialing down so that we know exactly what we want. Because you know, a lot of times, have you noticed this? That human beings actually don't know what they want? Yeah, it's kind of hard to get it if you don't know what it is, all right? Good, I did this with one of my kids and you know, what I wanted was for him to do his homework. What he wanted was baseball camp. And I was like, awesome. What would you like baseball camp? I'm like, yes, I will attach homework to baseball camp. Give me a few minutes, okay? And we got to it. Now, I want us to take a second, get really deep, and I don't know how much more time we have. Um, let's get really deep for a sec. Um, something that I find is beneath, is like subterranean, below most problems human beings have, is that their organismic rights are not being honored. Many of us are raised to, raise your hand if this is familiar, take care of everybody else, make sure everybody else is okay, and then if there's any spare time, maybe we'll take a minute and figure out what we actually want, okay? Now, it does happen to men too, it's not just a female thing. Um, I want us to take a sec, as I walk you through this, give yourself the gift of writing down what yours are, okay? Don't make the mistake on saying this whole word because it can be challenging, you might want to call them org rights, when you discuss them with your colleagues, okay? <laughs> if you miss one letter, it's a situation, okay? <laughs> All right, so Wilhelm Reich, back in the 50s and 60s, unpacked that between zero and three, our little baby brain observes our world and determines how we fit into it, okay? By four, we're a little person. Anybody who has a kid, by four, it's like they're, li they're a little person with magical thinking trying to take mommy and daddy's pain away, okay? Zero to three is when the baking happens. So think about this, the right to exist, okay? Well, of course I have the right to exist, my body is here. Not necessarily. And if it's easier, think about somebody else first. Think about somebody that you know in your life that gets kind of small, you know? Especially in times of conflict or when emotions come up. They sort of get a little small or they intellectualize. Ah, here's some emotion. I will get very logical, okay? Because it's uncomfortable to exist around all of that emotion. So start to think about this for a sec. And one thing I didn't mention earlier is that human beings, now we know this, MIT, Stanford, Harvard, NYU, Carnegie Mellon, Columbia, um, have all done research to back that 90% of our decisions, 90% of our behaviors are driven, are dominated by our emotional brain. Whoa, but I'm intellectual. Yeah, that's 10%, good, good luck with that, okay? 90%, this is why emotional resilience is so important. This is why when we use these tools, our clients perform so much better, much higher profit per employee, much better retention, much easier recruiting, all that stuff, coming back. So notice, look at your little sheet for a sec, how am I doing on right to exist? And here's how you shift your colleagues when they have low right to exist. Okay, so I want us to unpack ours. So take a sec, between zero and five, where zero is no right to exist at all, 
Five is I've totally got this nailed. Take a second, think about this. If you can say I have the right to exist and it feels like saying I have a mobile phone, like a statement of fact, okay? Then, and honest, right? Like your little baloney meter is not going into the red. <laughs> if you can really say that, then you have a higher right to exist. So just take a second, jot this down, feel into it, say to yourself internally, I have a right to exist, and see what number feels honest for you. This is between you and you. Nobody has to share this. And just jot it down, zero through five, where five is the highest, okay? Jot that one down. And next, let's go to the right to have needs. The right to have needs. If a person is frequently putting other people's needs before their own, somebody doesn't even know what their needs are, they're constantly self-sacrificing, take one, taking one for the team, they probably have a pretty low right to have needs. Okay? You can look later at how to unpack that and how to help somebody get a higher right to have needs, but for starters, let's just drop in. Zero to five, rate yourself. Say yourself internally, I have the right to have needs, and just see what number feels honest. Okay, and jot that down. And you'll notice that when you get most upset, most triggered, most angry, most messed up, most in critter state, it's because certain of these organismic rights are not being honored. So the sooner we get present to where we have the lowest org rights, the easier it is for us to start to use the suggestions that we're giving you to increase your org rights. Higher org rights, less critter state, better relationships, et cetera. And the screen is off. Here we go. Boop. Okay, let's do a couple more. Right to take action. Anybody know somebody at their office or in their workplace where it's just like for some reason, it's like they don't like to commit to stuff, they just can't like kind of get it done and just like go, yeah? they probably have a low right to take action, okay? Yeah, between zero and three, their little baby brain said, you know, it's not such a good idea to charge in there because based on what was happening in their environment, remember their prefrontal cortex wasn't cooked yet. For women, our, P our PFC is cooked by the time that we're 21, but for men, it's 25, which is why the military is like, get them in before they're 25, right? Because at 25, they'd be like, hell no, I'm not going to shoot guns at people. <laughs> but before that, it's like, ooh, adventure. Yeah, my prefrontal cortex isn't cooked anyway. Let's do it, right? So coming back here, zero through five, what's true for you? Right to take action. Jot it down. Five is high. Right to have consequences. Next. Think about this for a sec. Right to have consequences. What if we take action and it doesn't work out so great? Do we feel like, oh no, well it was Bob's fault, it was Sue's fault, are we finger pointing? Or do we say, you know what, I messed up, here's how I'm gonna fix it. How comfortable is it for us to have consequences for our actions? So take a second drop into that. Again, we all know people who have low org rights. I want you to just, to, and if you can't do it now, do it in the bathtub later, because you gotta know this stuff. It will change your life, okay? And for those of you who are like, huh, I'd like to learn more about this, chapter four in uh, Power Your Tribe. All right, and remember, for your colleagues, you can sit down and you can have some fun with this too, and this is how you can help them. Right to love and be loved. Notice it's a combo pack, it's not right to love. Loving is easy. Love and be loved. So you have to let it in, all right? So you can't just go, woo, outward, it's easy, okay? Not all of us can let all that love and support in, so it's a combo pack, okay? So maybe when a person is uncomfortable giving affection, when a person says, oh, I'm not a hugger. Yeah, I don't hug. That's a, that's a really clear cue. <laughs> if somebody starts emoting and they're like, I'm out of here, there's emotion, get me out of here, okay? So I want you to start to think about this. If you can't be around, if someone's sad, they're like, oh, don't be sad, right? How effective is that? It's like, that, yeah, I don't like you at all now. <laughs> I wasn't sure before, right? <laughs> so the right to love or be loved, can you not only offer the love, but can you actually let it in? Zero through five, check it out with your experiences. You might want to do this with your uh, spouse. You might want to do this with one, one of your friends because then they can say, hey, how are you doing on honoring, honoring your needs in such and such situation? And you can then start to strengthen them and become more 
resilient. Questions on org rights? Yes. Um, so these five rights aren't expressed on the page as hierarchical, but it occurs to me that they could be, and I'd love to learn more about how you experience them as dynamic interplay. Okay, yes. How do these guys interplay? Did you notice when you look at these that some of these guys seem like maybe they're related? Yes, thank you, yes. So which ones stood out to you that might have a relationship? Um, well, just actually many, but as an example, um, action and consequence, when I read victim totally. language, like victims generally can't move toward action. Yep. And so that's just one example. Yep, but exactly, thank you. Right to take action, right to have consequences. Usually those are bedfellows. Check out this one that's more sophisticated. People always say to me, oh, well not always, very often say to me, oh, I have a really high right to exist. Like, I'm here. Oh, do you guys remember the gay anthem? This was perfect right to exist. Perfect. In the um, 1980s. We're here. We're queer. Get used to it. That is like right to exist. I love that. It's just like, yeah, boom. This is me. I'm here. I'm owning it. <laughs> so think of the gay anthem. That's like a great, that's a great one. Or the gay march. That's perfect for right to exist. Can you have needs if you don't exist? Ooh, yeah, you saw, you guys are like going, nur, 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 zzz, 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 zzz. yeah. These guys are totally connected. Because people go, oh, yeah, I totally have a right to exist. I'm like, well, kind of seems like you're self-sacrificing a lot. Kind of seems like you're working 90 hours a week. Kind of seems like you're not looking out for yourself, right? So these guys are totally affected, okay? So I find that these guys are, Connected, rather, pardon me. Those guys are connected. Right to love and be loved is just like, woo, that's uh, all over the place. It's just a big whopper. Thank you. So what's cool, though, is what if one were to increase their right to exist? Might it boost their right to have needs? What if one, it, maybe that was a little too cosmic for them. What if one was just going to be really good about honoring their needs? might that also increase their right to exist? Woo, yes. So you can go at it from whatever angle is gonna work best for you, right? Good, good, cool. We're gonna end in, okay, I wasn't sure if that was jazz hands or if that was five. Okay, five, <laughs> good, good. All right, so I think that that's all I was, oh, okay, so we're on this mission. Did you like those pictures, were they cute? I thought yeah. they were super cute. Tammy at our office made them. So we have a ton of these little pictures, and we created this little emotional resilience mini course, and we'll send you a little one each week, a picture and a description as to how to use the tool. Forward it to your team. You'll have a better life if they're resilient as well. If you want that, you can either, you can either go to smarttribesinstitute.com slash emotion, okay, and just put your email in and you'll start to get the little resilience course, or you can, um, oh, I guess you can leave your contact info, and I'll give it to my team, and they will type it in. All right, good. All right, one last question, two last questions, or are we totally good? Are we ready for like matching and cocktails? Do you have a question? Yeah. Was there one part of the brain where PTSD gets trapped? Is it the melanin level? Mammalian. PTSD is a is a situation. PTSD affects a lot of parts of the brain. Um, uh, the mammalian brain, um, yes, um, uh, the amygdala, a lot. This is why mindfulness is so good, or meditation, does anybody meditate here? Seriously, S S Harvard did a great study. If after eight weeks you do 20 minutes, and it can be, it can be four sessions of five minutes, just 20 minutes a day, whatever flavor, whatever mix and match you want. The prefrontal cortex increases greater vision, the amygdala cell density uh, reduces, less aggression, less irritation, okay, less quick to respond with anger. The hippocampus, uh, the cell density in the hippocampus expands, easier to learn and greater memory. Woo! So yeah, PTSD, it's big. Primarily the, the thalamus and the um, signaling from the amygdala. One other one? Oh, thank you, thank you. Over eight weeks, doing 20 minutes per day, and it can be in chunks of five minutes, it doesn't matter, okay? Yes, then we get the three physiological changes. 
yeah, super exciting research. Yeah. All right, cool. All right, thanks, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.